Volume 2, Book 8, Chapter 7, Part 2 of The Life of Apollonius of Tyana. The Life of Apollonius of Tyana by Flavius Philostratus. Translated by F. C. Conybeare. Volume 2, Book 8. Chapter 7, Part 2. 9. The accuser here interrupts me. You hear him yourself do so, my prince. And he remarks that I am not accused for having brought about the salvation of the Ephesians, but for having foretold that the plague would fall upon them. For this, he says, transcends the power of wisdom and is miraculous, so that I could never have reached such a pitch of truth if I were not a wizard and an unspeakable wretch. What then will Socrates say here of the lore which he declared he learned from his demonic genius? Or what would Thales or Anaxagoras, both Ionians, say, of whom one foretold a plenteous crop of olives, and the other not a few meteorological disturbances? That they foretold these things by dint of being wizards? Why is it not a fact that they were brought before the law courts upon other charges, but that no one ever heard among their accusations that of their being wizards, because they had the gift of foreknowledge? For that would have been thought ridiculous, and it would not have been a plausible charge to bring against men of wisdom even in Thessaly, where the women had a bad reputation for drawing the moon down to earth. How, then, did I get my sense of the coming disaster at Ephesus? You have listened to the statement made even by my accuser, that instead of living like other people, I keep to a light diet of my own, and prefer it to the luxury of others and I began by saying so myself. This diet, my king, guards my senses in a kind of indescribable ether or clear air, and forbids them to contract any foul or turbid matter, and allows me to discern, as in the sheen of a looking-glass, everything that is happening or is to be. For the sage will not wait for the earth to send up its exaltations, or for the atmosphere to be corrupted, in case the evil is shed from above, but he will notice these things when they are impending, not so soon indeed as the gods, yet sooner than the many. For the gods perceive what lies in the future, and men what is going on before them, and wise men what is approaching. But I would have told you, my prince, ask of me in private about the causes of pestilence, for they are secrets of a wisdom which should not be divulged to the many. Was it then my mode of living, which alone develops such a subtlety and keenness of perception as can apprehend the most important and wonderful phenomena, you can ascertain the point in question, not only from other considerations, but, in particular, from what took place in Ephesus in connection with that plague. For the genius of the pestilence, and it took the form of a poor old man, I both detected, and having detected, took it captive, and I did not so much stay the disease as pluck it out. And who the god was to whom I had offered my prayers is shown in the statue which I set up in Ephesus to commemorate the event. And it is a temple of the Hercules who averts disease, for I chose him to help me because he is the wise and courageous god who once purged of the plague the city of Elis by washing away with the river tide the foul exhalations which the land sent up under the tyranny of Auges. Who then do you think, my prince, being ambitious to be considered a wizard, would dedicate his personal achievement to a god? And whom would he get to admire his art if he gave the credit of the miracle to god? And who would offer his prayers to Hercules if he were a wizard? For in fact, these wretches attribute such feats to the trenches they dig, and to the gods of the under-earth, among whom we must not class Heracles, for he is a pure deity and kindly to men. I offered my prayer to him once on a time also in the Peloponnese, for there was an apparition of a Lamia there too, and it infested the neighborhood of Corinth, and devoured good-looking young men. And Hercules lent me his aid in my contest with her, without asking of me any wonderful gifts, nothing more than honey-cake and frankincense, and the chance to do a salutary turn to mankind. For in the case of Eurystheus also, 
this was the only guerdon which he was thought of for his labors. I would ask you, my prince, not to be displeased at my mention of Hercules, for Athene had him under her care because he was good and kind and a savior of man. 10. But inasmuch as you bid me vindicate myself in the matter of the sacrifice, for I observe you beckoning with your hand for me to do so, hear my defense. It shall set the truth before you. In all my actions I have at heart the salvation of mankind, yet I have never offered a sacrifice in their behalf, nor will I ever sacrifice anything, nor touch sacraments in which there is blood, nor offer any prayer with my eyes fixed upon a knife, or a sacrifice as he understands it. It is no Scythian, my prince, that you have got before you, nor a native of some savage and inhospitable land nor did I ever mingle with Mesagetai or Tarians, for in that case I should have reformed even them and altered their sacrificial custom. But to what a depth of folly and in consequence should I have descended if, after talking so much about divination and about the conditions under which it flourishes or does not flourish, I, who understand better than any one that the gods reveal their intentions to holy and wise men, even without their possessing prophetic gifts, made myself guilty of bloodshed by meddling with the entrails of victims, as unacceptable to myself as they are ill-omened. In that case, the revelation of heaven would surely have abandoned me as impure. However, if we drop the fact that I have a horror of any such sacrifice, and just examine the accuser in respect to the statements which he made a little earlier, he himself acquits me of this charge. For if, as he says, I could foretell to the Ephesians the impending pestilence without use of any sacrifice whatever, what need had I of slaying victims in order to discover what lay within my cognizance without offering any sacrifice at all? And what need had I of divination in order to find out things of which I myself was already assured as well as another. For if I am to be put upon my trial on account of Nerva and his companions, I shall repeat what I said to you the day before yesterday, when you accused me about these matters. For I regard Nerva as a man worthy of the highest office, and of all the consideration that belongs to a good name and fame, but as one ill calculated to carry through any difficult plan, for his frame is undermined by a disease which fills his soul with bitterness and incapacitates him even for his home affairs. As to yourself, certainly he admires your vigor of body no less than he admires your judgment, and in doing so I think he is not singular, because men are by nature more prone to admire what they themselves lack the strength to do. But Nerva is also animated towards myself by feelings of respect, and I never saw him in my presence laughing or joking as he is accustomed to do among his friends. But like young men towards their fathers and teachers, he observes a reverence in everything that he says in my presence, nay, he even blushes. And because he knows that I appreciate and set so high a value upon modesty, he therefore so sedulously cultivates that quality as sometimes to appear, even to me, humbler than beseems him. Who then can regard it as probable that Nerva is ambitious of empire, when he is only too glad if he can govern his own household? Or that a man who has not the nerve to discuss with me minor issues, would discuss with me the greatest of all, or would concert with me plans which, if he thought like myself, he would not even concert with others? How again could I retain my reputation for wisdom and interpreting a man's judgment if I believed overmuch in divination, yet wholly distrusted wisdom? As for Orphitus and Rufus, who are just and sensible men, though somewhat sluggish, as I well know to be the case, if they say that they are under suspicion of aspiring to become despots, I hardly know over which they make the greater mistake, over them or over Nerva. If, however, they are accused of being his accomplices, then I ask, which you would most readily believe, that Nerva was usurping the throne, 
or that they had conspired with him. 11. I must confess that there are also other points which the accuser who brings me to the bar on these accounts should have entertained and considered. What sense was there in my aiding these revolutionists? For he does not say that I received any money from them, nor that I was tempted by presence to commit these crimes. But let us consider the point whether I might not have advanced great claims, but have deferred their recognition of them until the time came at which they expected to win the throne, when I might have demanded much and have obtained still more as my due. But how can you prove all this? Call to mind, my prince, your own reign and the reigns of your predecessors, I mean of your own brother and of your father and of Nero under whom they held office. For it was under these princes chiefly that I passed my life before the eyes of all, the rest of my time being spent on my visit to India. Well, of these thirty-eight years, for such is the period which has elapsed since then up to your own day, I have never come near the courts of princes, except that once in Egypt, and then it was your father's, though he was not at that time actually emperor, and he admitted that he came there on my account. Nor have I ever uttered anything base or humiliating either to emperors, or in behalf of emperors to peoples. Nor have I sought distinction through letters, which princes might either write to myself, or I myself ostentatiously address to them. Nor have I ever demeaned myself by flattery of princes, in order to win their largesse. If then, after due consideration of rich and poor, you should ask me in which class I register myself, I should say, among the very rich. For the fact that I want nothing is worth to me all the wealth of Lydia and of Pactolus. It is likely, then, that I, who never would take presents from yourself, whose throne I regarded as perfectly secure, should either have gone cadging to mere pretenders, and have deferred the receipt of my recompense from them until such a time as I thought would find them emperors, or that I should plan a change of dynasty, who never once, for purposes of my advancement, resorted to that which was already established. And yet, if you want to know how much a philosopher may obtain by flattery of the mighty, you have only got to look at the case of Euphrates. For why do I speak of his having got mere money out of them? Why, he has perfect fountains of wealth, and already at the banks he discusses prices as a merchant might, or a huckster, or tax-gatherer, a low money-changer. For all these roles are his if there is anything to buy or sell, and he clings like a limpet to the doors of the mighty, and you see him standing at them more regularly than any doorkeeper. Indeed, he often outstays the doorkeepers, just as greedy dogs would do. But he never yet bestowed a farthing upon any philosopher. But he walls up all his wealth within his own house, only supporting this Egyptian out of the money of others, and wetting against me a tongue which ought to have been cut out. 12. However, I will leave Euphrates to yourself, for unless you approve of flatterers, you will find the fellow worse than I depict him, and I only ask you to listen to the rest of my apology. What then is it to be, and from what accounts is it to defend me? In the act of accusation, my prince, a regular dirge is chanted over an Arcadian boy, whom I am accused of having cut up by night, perhaps in a dream, for I am sure I do not know. This child is said to be of respectable parentage, and to have possessed all the good looks which Arcadians wear even in the midst of squalor. They pretend that I massacred him in spite of his entreaties and lamentations, and that after thus imbruing my hands in the blood of this child, I prayed the gods to reveal the truth to me. So far, they only attack myself in their charges, but what follows is a direct assault upon the gods. For they assert that the gods heard my prayers under such circumstances, and vouchsafed to me victims of good omen, instead of slaying me for my impiety. Need I say, O my prince, it is defiling even to listen to such stuff. But to confine my pleadings to the counts which affect myself, I would ask 
Who is this Arcadian? For since he was not of nameless parentage, and by no means slave-like in appearance, it is time for you to ask what was the name of those who begot him, and of what family he was, and what city in Arcadia had the honor of rearing him, and from what altars he was dragged away in order to be sacrificed here. My accuser does not supply this information, in spite of his ingenuity in the art of lying. Let us then suppose it was only a slave in whose behalf he accuses me. For, by heaven, we surely must class among slaves one who had neither name of his own, nor parentage, nor city, nor inheritance. For slaves have no proper names of their own. In that case, who was the slave merchant who sold him? Who was it that bought him from Arcadians? For if this breed is specially suitable for the butchering kind of diviners, he must surely have purchased the boy for such money. And some messenger must have sailed straight to the Peloponnese in order to fetch this Arcadian and conduct him to us. For though one can buy here on the spot slaves from Pontus or Lydia or Phrygia, for indeed you can meet whole droves of them being conducted hither, since these, like other barbarous races, have always been subject to foreign masters, and as yet see nothing disgraceful in servitude. Anyhow, with the Phrygians it is a fashion even to sell their children, and once they are enslaved they never think any more about them. Yet the Hellens retain their love of liberty, and no man of Hellas will ever sell a slave out of his country for which reason kidnappers and slave-dealers never resort thither, least of all to Arcadia. For, in addition to the fact that they are beyond all other Hellens jealous of liberty, they also require a great number of slaves themselves. For Arcadia contains a vast expanse of grassland and of timber, which covers not only the highlands, but also the plains as well. Consequently, they require a great many laborers, many goatherds and swineherds, and shepherds and drivers, either for the oxen or for the horses. And there is much need in the land of woodcutters, a craft to which they are trained from boyhood. And even if the land of Arcadia were not such as I have described, so that they could in addition afford, like other nations, to sell their own slaves abroad, what advantage could the wisdom the accuser babbles of derive by getting a child from Arcadia to murder and cut up. For the Arcadians are not so much wiser than other Hellens, that their entrails should convey more information than those of other people. On the contrary, they are the most boorish of men, and resemble hogs in other ways, and especially in this that they can stomach acorns. It is possible that I have conducted my defense on more rhetorical lines than is my custom, in thus characterizing the habits of the Arcadians and digressing into the Peloponnese. What, however, is my right line of defense? This, I think, I never sacrificed blood. I do not sacrifice it now. I never touch it, not even if it be shed upon an altar. For this was the rule of Pythagoras, and likewise of his disciples, and in Egypt also of the naked sages, and of the sages of India, from whom these principles of wisdom were derived by Pythagoras and his school. In adhering to this way of sacrifice, they do not seem to the gods to be criminal, for the latter suffer them to grow old, sound in body and free from disease, and to increase in wisdom daily, to be free from tyranny of others, to be wanting in nothing. Nor do I think it is unlikely that the gods have need of good men in order to offer them pure sacrifices. For I believe that the gods have the same mind as myself in the matter of sacrifice, and that they therefore place those parts of the earth which grow frankincense in the purest region of the world, in order that we may use their resources for purposes of sacrifice without drawing the knife in their temples, or shedding blood upon altars. And yet, it appears, I so far forgot myself and the gods, as to sacrifice with rites which are not only unusual with myself, but which no human being would employ. 12. 
Let me add that the very hour which my accuser alleges acquits me of this charge. For on that day, the day on which he says I committed this crime, I allow that, if I was in the country, I offered sacrifice, and that if I sacrificed, then I ate of the victim. And yet, my prince, you repeatedly ask me if I was not staying at Rome at that time. And you too, O oh best of princes, were staying there, and yet you would not, on that account, admit you offered such a sacrifice. And my false accuser was there likewise, but he will not own on that account that he committed murder, just because he was living in Rome. And the same is the case of thousands of people, whom you would do better to expel as strangers than expose to acts of accusation, if in these the mere fact of their having been in Rome is to be held to be a proof of their guilt. On the other hand, the fact of my coming to Rome is in itself a disproof of the charge of revolutionary plotting. For to live in a city where there are so many eyes to see and so many ears to hear things which are and which are not, is a serious handicap for anyone who desires to play at revolution, unless he be wholly intent upon his own death. On the contrary, it prompts prudent and sensible people to walk slowly even when engaged in wholly permissible pursuits. 14. What then, O sycophant, was I really doing on that night? Suppose I were yourself, and was being asked this question, inasmuch as you are come to ask questions. Why then, the answer would be this. I was trumping up actions and accusations against decent and respectable people, and I was trying to ruin the innocent, and to persuade the emperor by dint of hard lying, in order that while I myself climbed to fame, I might soil him with the blood of my victims. If again you ask me as a philosopher, I was praising the laughter with which Demetrius laughed at all human affairs. But if you ask me as being myself, here is my answer. Philiscus of Melos, who was my fellow pupil in philosophy for four years, was ill at the time, and I was sleeping out at his house, because he was suffering so terribly when he died of his disease. Ah, many are the charms I would have prayed to obtain, if they could have saved his life. Fain would I have known of any melodies of Orpheus, if any there are, to bring back the dead to us. Nay, I verily think I would have made a pilgrimage even to the netherworld for his sake, if such things were feasible. So deeply attached was I to him by all his conduct, so worthy of a philosopher, and so much in accord with my own ideals. Here are facts, my prince, which you may learn also from Telesinus, the consul, for he too was at the bedside of the man of Melos, and nursed him by night, like myself. But if you do not believe Telesinus, because he is of the number of philosophers, I call upon the physicians to bear me witness. And they were the following, Seleucus of Sisychus and Stratocles of Sidon. Ask them whether I tell the truth. And what is more, they had with them over thirty of their disciples, who are ready, I believe, to witness to the same fact. For if I were to summon hither the relatives of Philiscus, you might probably think that I was trying to interpose delays in the case. For they have lately sailed from Rome to the Melian country, in order to pay their last sad respects to the dead. Come forward, O ye witnesses, for you have been expressly summoned to give your testimony upon this point. The witnesses give their evidence. With how little regard, then, for the truth this accusation has been drawn up, is clearly proved by the testimony of these gentlemen. For it appears that it was not in the suburbs, but in the city, not outside the wall, but inside a house, not with Nerva, but with Felicius, not slaying another, but praying for a man's life, not thinking of matters of state, but of philosophy, not choosing a revolutionist to supplant yourself, but trying to save a man like myself. 15. What, then, is the Arcadian doing in this case? What becomes of the absurd stories of victims slain? 
what is the use of urging you to believe such lies? For what never took place will be real if you decide that it did take place. And how, my prince, are you to rate the improbability of the sacrifice? For, of course, there have been long ago soothsayers skilled in the art of examining slain victims. For example, I can name Megistias of Acarnania, Aristandrus of Lycia, and Solanus, who was a native of Ambracia. And of these, the Acarnanian was sacrificer to Leonidas, the king of Sparta, and the Lycian to Alexander of Macedonia, and Solanus to Cyrus the Pretender. And supposing there had been found stored in the entrails of a human being some information truer or more profound or surer than usual, such a sacrifice was not difficult to effect, inasmuch as there were kings to preside over it, who had plenty of cupbearers at their disposal, besides plenty of prisoners of war as victims. And moreover, these monarchs could violate the law with impunity, and they had no fear of being accused, in case they committed so small a murder. But I believe these persons had the same conviction which I also entertain, who am now in risk of my life of such accusation, namely, that the entrails of animals which we slay while they are ignorant of death, are for that reason. And just because the animals lack all understanding of what they are about to suffer, free from disturbance. A human being, however, has constantly in his soul the apprehension of death, even when it does not as yet impend. How, therefore, is it likely that when death is already present and stares him in the face, he should be able to give any intimation of the future through his entrails, or to be a proper subject for sacrifice at all? In proof that my conjecture is right and consonant with nature, I would ask you, my prince, to consider the following points. The liver, in which adepts at this art declare the tripod of their divination to reside, is on the one hand not composed of pure blood, for all unmixed blood is retained by the heart, which through the blood vessels sends it flowing as if through canals over the entire body. The bile, on the other hand, lies over the liver, and whereas it is excited by anger, it is, on the other hand, driven back by fear into the cavities of the liver. Accordingly, if, on the one hand, it is caused to effervesce by irritants, and ceases to be able to contain itself in its own receptacle, it overflows the liver which underlies it, in which case the mass of bile occupies the smooth and prophetic parts of the bowels. On the other hand, under the influence of fear and panic, it subsides, and draws together into itself all the light which resides in the smooth parts. For in such cases, even that pure element in the blood recedes to which the liver owes its spleen-like look and distension, because the blood in question, by its nature, drains away under the membrane which encloses the entrails, and floats upon the muddy surface. Of what use, then, my prince, is it to slay a human victim if the sacrifice is going to furnish no presage? And human nature does render such rites useless for purposes of divination, because it has a sense of impending death, and dying men themselves meet their end, if with courage, then also with anger, and if with despondency, then also with fear. And for this reason, the art of divination, except in the case of the most ignorant savages, while recommending the slaying of kids and lambs, because these animals are silly and not far removed from being insensible, does not consider cocks and pigs and bulls worthy vehicles of its mysteries, because these creatures have too much spirit. I realize, my prince, that my accuser chafes at my discourse, because I find so intelligent a listener in yourself. For indeed, you seem to me to give your attention to my discourse. And if I have not clearly enough explained any point in it, I will allow you to ask me any questions about it. 16. I have then answered this Egyptian's act of accusation, but since I do not think I ought altogether to pass by the slanders of Euphrates, I would ask you, my prince, to judge between us, 
and decide which of us is more of a philosopher. Well then, whereas he strains every nerve to tell lies about myself, I disdain to do the like about him. And whereas he looks upon you as a despot, I regard you as a constitutional ruler. And while he puts the sword into your hand for use against me, I merely supply you with argument. But he makes the basis of his accusation the discourses which I delivered in Ionia, and he says that they contain matter much to your disadvantage. And yet, what I said concerned the topic of the fates and of necessity, and I only used as an example of my arguments the affairs of kings, because your rank is thought to be the highest of human ranks, and I dwelt upon the influence of the fates, and argued that the threads which they spin are so unchangeable, that, even if they decreed to someone a kingdom which at the moment belonged to another, and even if it, that other slew the man of destiny, to save himself from ever being deprived by him of his throne, nevertheless, the dead man would come to life again in order to fulfill the decree of the fates. For we employ hyperbole in our arguments in order to convince those who will not believe in what is probable, and it is just as if I had used such an example as this. He who is destined to become a carpenter will become one even if his hands have been cut off, and he who has been destined to carry off the prize for running in the Olympic Games will not fail to win even if he broke his leg. And a man to whom the fates have decreed that he shall be an eminent archer will not miss the mark even though he has lost his eyesight. And in drawing examples from royalty, I had reference, I believe, to the Acrisi, and the house of Laius, and to Astyages the Mede, and to many other monarchs who thought that they were well established in their kingdoms, and of whom some slew their own children, as they imagined, and others their descendants, and yet were subsequently deprived by them of their thrones, when they issued forth from obscurity in accordance with the decrees of fate. Well, if I were inclined to flattery, I should have said that I had your own history in mind when you were blockaded in the city by Vitellius, and the temple of Jupiter was burnt on the brow of the hill overlooking the city, and Vitellius declared that his own fortune was assured so long as you did not escape him. This, although you were at the time quite a stripling, and not the man you are now. And yet, because the fates had decreed otherwise, he was undone with all his counsels, while you are now in possession of his throne. However, since I abhor the concords of flattery, for it seems to me that they are everything that is out of time and out of tune, let me cut the string out of my lyre, and request you to consider that on that occasion I had not your fortunes in mind, but was talking exclusively of questions of the fates and of necessity. For it was in speaking of them that they accused me of having assailed yourself. And yet, such an argument as mine is tolerated by most of the gods, and even Zeus himself is not angry when he hears from the poet in The Story of Lycia this language. Alas, for myself, when Sarpedon, and there are other such strains referring to himself, such as those in which he accuses the fates of having deprived him of his son. And in the weighing of souls again, the poets tell you that, although after her death he presented Minos the brother of Sarpedon with a golden scepter, and appointed him judge in the court of Idonius, yet he could not exempt him from the decree of the fates. And you, my prince, why should you resent my argument when the gods put up with it, whose fortunes are forever fixed and assured, and who never slew poets on that account? For it is our duty to follow the fates and obey them, and not take offense with the changes in fortune, and to believe in Sophocles when he says, For the gods alone there comes no old age, nay, nor ever death but all other things are confounded by all mastering time. No man ever put the truth so well. For the prosperity of men runs in a circle, 
and the span of happiness, my prince, lasts for a single day. My property belongs to another, and his to another, and his again to a third, and each, in having, hath not. Think of this, my prince, and put a stop to your decrees of exile. Stay the shedding of blood, and have recourse to philosophy in your wishes and plans. For true philosophy feels no pangs. And in doing so, wipe away men's tears. For at present, echoes reach us from the sea of a thousand sighs. And they are redoubled from the continents, where each laments over his peculiar sorrows. Thence is bred an incalculable crop of evils, all of them due directly to the slanderous tongues of informers, who render all men objects of hatred to yourself, and yourself, O Prince, to all. End of Volume 2, Book 8, Chapter 7 Volume 2, Book 8, Chapters 8-19 through 19 of The Life of Apollonius of Tyana the Life of Apollonius of Tyana by Flavius Philostratus, translated by F. C. Conybeare, Volume 2, Book 8. Chapter 8. Such, then, was the oration which the sage had prepared beforehand, at the end whereof I found the last words of the earlier speech, namely, For thou shalt not kill me, since I tell thee I am not mortal together with the words which preceded and led up to this quotation. But the effect upon the despot of his quitting the court in a manner so godlike and inexplicable was quite other than that which the many expected, for they expected him to make a terrific uproar and institute a hunt for the man, and to send forth proclamations over his empire to arrest him wherever they should find him. But he did nothing of the kind as if he set himself to defeat men's expectations, or because he now at last realized that, as against the sage, he had no resources of his own. But whether he acted from contempt, let us conjecture from what ensued, for he will be seen to have been confounded with astonishment rather than filled with contempt. Chapter 9 for he had to hear another case after that of Apollonius, an action brought, I think, in connection with a will by some city against a private individual. And he had forgotten not only the names of the parties, but also the matter at issue in the suit. For his questions were without meaning, and his answers were not relevant to the case, all which argued the degree of astonishment and perplexity under which the despot labored the more so because his flatterers had persuaded him that nothing could escape his memory. Chapter 10 Such was the condition to which Apollonius reduced the despot, making him a plaything of his philosophy, who had been the terror of Helens and barbarians. And before midday he left the court, and at dusk appeared to Demetrius and Damis at Dicaarchia, and this accounts for his having instructed Damis to go by land to Dica Archia, without waiting to hear his defense. For he had given no previous notice of his intentions, but had merely told the man who was mostly in his intimacy to do what best accorded with his plans. Chapter 11 Now Damis had arrived the day before, and had talked with Demetrius about the preliminaries of the trial, and the account filled the latter when he listened to it, with more apprehension than you might expect of a listener when Apollonius was in question. The next day also he asked him afresh about the same particulars as he wandered with him along the edge of the sea, which figures in the fables told about Calypso, for they were almost in despair of their master coming to them, because the tyrant's hand was hard upon all. Yet, out of respect for Apollonius's character, they obeyed his instructions. Discouraged, then, they sat down in the chamber of the nymphs, where there is a cistern of white marble, which contains a spring of water which neither overflows its edges nor recedes, even if water be drawn from it. They were talking about the quality of the water in no very serious manner, and presently, owing to the anxiety they felt about the sage, 
brought back their conversation to the circumstances which preceded the trial. Chapter 12 Damis's grief had just broken out afresh, and he had made some such exclamation as the following. Shall we ever behold, O ye gods, our noble and good companion? When Apollonius, who had heard him, for, as a matter of fact, he was already present in the chamber of the nymphs, answered, Ye shall see him, nay, ye have already seen him. Demetrius said, Alive? For, if you are dead, we have anyhow never ceased to lament you. Whereupon Apollonius stretched out his hand and said, Take hold of me, and if I evade you, then I am indeed a ghost come to you from the realm of Persephone, such as the gods of the underworld reveal to those who are dejected with much mourning. But if I resist your touch, then you shall persuade Damis also that I am both alive and that I have not abandoned my body. They were no longer able to disbelieve, but rose up and threw themselves on his neck and kissed him and asked him about his defense. For while Demetrius was of opinion that he had not even made his defense, for he expected him to be destroyed without any wrong being proved against him, Damis thought that he had made his defense, but perhaps more quickly than was expected, for he never dreamed that he had made it only that day. But Apollonius said, I have made my defense, gentlemen, and have gained my cause, and my defense took place this very day not so long ago, for it lasted on even to midday. Demetrius said, how then have you accomplished so long a journey in so small a fraction of the day? And Apollonius replied, Imagine what you will, flying goat or wings of wax excepted, so long as you ascribe it to the intervention of a divine escort. Demetrius said, Well, I have always thought that your actions and words were providentially cared for by some god to whom you owe your present preservation. Nevertheless, pray, tell us about the defense you made, what it consisted of, and what the accusation had to say against you, and about the temper of the judge, and what questions he put, and what he allowed to pass of your pleas, and what not. Tell us all at once, in order that I may tell everything in turn to Telesinus, for he will never leave off asking me about your affairs. For about fifteen days back he was drinking with me at Antium, when he fell asleep at table, and just as the middle cup in honor of the good genius was being passed round, he dreamed a dream, and he saw a fire spreading like a sea over the land, and it enveloped some men, and caught up others as they fled, for it flowed along, he said, exactly like water. But you alone suffered not the fate of the rest, but swam clean through it as it divided to let you through and in honor of the gods who inspire such happy presages, he poured out a libation in consequence of this dream, and he bade me be of good cheer on your account. And Apollonius said, I am not surprised at Telesinus dreaming about me, for in his vigils, I assure you, he long ago occupied his mind about me. But as regards the trial, you shall learn everything, but not in this place. For it is already growing late in the evening, and it is time for us to proceed to the town, and it is pleasant, too, to talk as you go along the road, for conversation assists you on your way like an escort. Let us then start and discuss your questions as we go along, and I will certainly tell you of today's events in the court. For both of you know the circumstances which preceded the trial, the one of you because he was present and the other because, I am sure by Zeus, he has not heard it only once, but again and again, if I know you well, my Demetrius. But I will relate to you what you do not know as yet, beginning with my being summoned into the emperor's presence, into which I was ushered naked. And he proceeded to detail to them his own words, and above all, at the end of them, the citation, for thou shalt not kill me. 
and he told them exactly how he vanished from the seat of judgment. Chapter 13 Whereupon Demetrius cried out, I thought you had come hither because you were saved, but this is only the beginning of your dangers, for he will proscribe you, seize your person, and cut off all means of escape. Apollonius, however, told Demetrius not to be afraid, and encouraged him by saying, I only wish that you were both no more easy for him to catch than I am. But I know exactly in what condition of mind the tyrant is at this moment. Hitherto he has never heard anything except the utterances of flatterers, and now he has had to listen to the language of rebuke. Such language breaks despotic natures down and enrages them. But I require some rest, for I have not bent the knee since I had this struggle. And Damis said, Demetrius, my own attitude towards our friend's affairs was such that I tried to dissuade him from taking the journey which he has taken, and I believe you too gave the same advice, namely, that he should not rush of his own accord into dangers and difficulties. But when he was thrown into fetters, as I saw with my own eyes, and I was perplexed and in despair of his case, he told me that it rested with himself to release himself, and he freed his leg from the fetters and showed it to me. Well, it was then, for the first time, that I understood our master to be a divine being, transcending all our poor wisdom and knowledge. Consequently, even if I were called upon to expose myself to still greater risks than these, I should not fear anything, as long as I was under his protection. But since the evening is at hand, let us go into the inn, and minister to, and take care of him. And Apollonius said, Sleep is all I want, and everything else is a matter of indifference to me, whether I get it or whether I do not. And after that, having offered a prayer to Apollo and also to the sun, he passed into the house in which Demetrius lived, and having washed his feet and instructed Damis and his friends to take their supper, for he saw that they were fasting, he threw himself upon the bed, and having intoned some verses of Homer as a hymn to sleep, he took his repose, as if his circumstances gave him no just cause whatever for anxiety. Chapter 14 About dawn, Demetrius asked him where on earth he would turn his steps, for there resounded in his ears the clatter of imaginary horsemen, who he thought were already in hot pursuit of Apollonius, on account of the rage of the tyrant. But Apollonius merely replied, Neither he nor any one else is going to pursue me, but as for myself I shall take sail for Hellas. Said the other, That is anyhow a dangerous voyage, for the region is most exposed and open. And how are you going to be hid out in the open from one whom you cannot escape in the dark? Apollonius said, I do not need to lie hid, for, if, as you imagine, the entire earth belongs to the tyrant, it is better to die out in the open than to live in the dark and in hiding. In turning to Damis, he said, Do you know of a ship that is starting for Sicily? He replied, I do, for we are staying on the edge of the sea, and the crier is at our doors, and a ship is just being got ready to start as I gather from the shouts of the crew, and from the exertions they are making over weighing anchor. Apollonius said, Let us embark upon this ship, O Damis, for we will now sail to Sicily, and thence on to the Peloponnese. Said the other, I am agreeable, so let us sail. Chapter 15 They then said farewell to Demetrius, who was despondent about them, but they bade him hope for the best, as one brave man should for others as brave as himself. And then they sailed for Sicily with a favorable wind, and having passed Messina, they reached Taromanium on the third day. After that, they arrived at Syracuse and put out for the Peloponnese about the beginning of the autumn. And having traversed the gulf, they arrived after six days at the mouth of the Alpheus, where that river pours its waters, still sweet, into the Adriatic and Sicilian Sea. Here they disembarked, 
and thinking it well worth their while to go to Olympia, they went and stayed there in the temple of Zeus, though without ever going further away than Scylus. A rumor as sudden as insistent now ran through the Hellenic world that the sage was alive and had arrived at Olympia. At first the rumor seemed unreliable, for besides that they were humanly speaking unable to entertain any hope of him inasmuch as they heard that he was cast into prison, they had also heard such rumors as that he had been burnt alive, or dragged about alive with grapnels fixed in his neck, or cast into a deep pit or into a well. But when the rumor of his arrival was confirmed, they all flocked to see him from the whole of Greece, and never did any such crowd flock to any Olympic festival as then, all full of enthusiasm and expectation. People came straight from Elis and Sparta, and from Corinth away at the limits of the Isthmus, and the Athenians too, although they are outside the Peloponnese, nor were they behind the cities which are at the gates of Pisa, for it was especially the most celebrated of the Athenians that hurried to the temple, together with the young men who flocked to Athens from all over the earth. Moreover, there were people from Megara just then staying at Olympia, as well as many from Boeotia and from Argos, and all the leading people of Phocis and Thessaly. Some of them had already made Apollonius's acquaintance, anxious to pick up his wisdom afresh, for they were convinced that there remained much to learn, more striking than what they had so far heard. But those who were not acquainted with him thought it a shame that they should seem never to have heard so great a man discourse. In answer to their questions, then, of how he had escaped the clutches of the tyrant, he did not deem it right to say anything boastful but he merely told them that he had made his defense and got away safely. However, when several people arrived from Italy, who bruited about the episode of the law court, the attitude of Hellas came near to that of actual worship. The main reason why they thought him divine was this, that he never made the least parade about the matter. Chapter 16 Among the arrivals from Athens, there was a youth who asserted that the goddess Athena was very well disposed to the emperor, whereupon Apollonius said to him, In Olympia, please to stop your chatter of such things, for you will prejudice the goddess in the eyes of her father. But as the youth increased their annoyance by declaring that the goddess was quite right, because the emperor was Archon Eponym of the city of Athena, he said, would that he also presided at the Panathenaic festival. By the first of his answers he silenced him, for he showed that he held a poor opinion of the gods, and he considered them to be well disposed to tyrants. By his second he showed that the Athenians would stultify the decree which they passed, in honor of Harmodius and Aristogaiton, if, after seeing fit to honor these two citizens with statues in the marketplace, for the deed they committed at the Panathenaic festival, they ended by conferring on tyrants the privilege of being elected to govern them. Chapter 17 Damis approached him at this time to ask him about money, because they had so very little left to defray the expense of their journey. Apollonius said, Tomorrow I will attend to this. And on the next day he went into the temple and said to the priest, Give me a thousand drachmas out of the treasury of Zeus, if you think he will not be too much annoyed. And the priest answered, Not at that. What will annoy him will be if you do not take more. Chapter 18 There was a man of Thessaly named Isagoras, whom he met in Olympia, and said, Tell me, Isagoras, is there such a thing as a religious fair or festival? He replied, Why, yes and by heaven there is nothing in the world of men so agreeable and so dear to the gods. Apollonius asked, And what is the matter of which it is composed? It is as if I asked you about the material of which this image is made, and you answered me that it was composed of gold and ivory. Said the other, But what material, Apollonius, can a thing which is incorporeal be composed of? Apollonius replied, 
a most important material, and most varied in character, for there are sacred groves in it, and shrines, and race courses, and, of course, a theatre, and tribes of men, some of them from the neighboring countries, and others from over the borders, and even from across the sea. He added, Moreover, many arts go to make up such a festival, and many designs, and much true genius, both of poets and of civil counsellors, and of those who deliver harangues on philosophic topics, and contests between naked athletes, and contests of musicians, as is the custom in the Pythian festival. Said the other, It seems to me, O Apollonius, that the festival is not only something corporeal, but is made up of more wonderful material than our cities, for there is summoned together into one community on such occasions the best of the best, and the most celebrated of the celebrated. Apollonius said, Then, O Isagoras, are we to consider the people we meet there in the same light as some people regard walls and ships, or do you need some other opinion of the festival? Answered the other, the opinion which we have formulated is quite adequate and complete, O man of Tyana, and we had better adhere to it, said the other. And yet it is neither adequate nor complete to one who considers about it as I do, for it appears to me that ships are in need of men and men of ships, and that men would never have thought about the sea at all if they had not had a ship, and men are kept safe by walls and walls by men. And in the same way I consider a festival to be not only the meeting of human beings, but also the place itself in which they have to meet, and the more so because walls and ships would never have come into being unless there had been men's hands to build them, while these places, so far forth as they are deprived of their natural and original characteristics, are by the hands of men spoiled and it was owing to their natural advantages that they were held worthy of being made their meeting places. For though the gymnasiums and porticos and fountains and houses have been all created by human art, just like the walls and the ships, yet the river Alpheus with the hippodrome and the stadium and the groves existed, I suppose, before men came here, the one providing water for drinking and for the bath and the second a broad plain for the horses to race in, and the third provided just the space required for the athletes to raise the dust in as they run along their races, namely, a valley, a stadium in length, and the groves around supplied wreaths for the winners, and served the athletes who were runners as a place to practice in. For I imagine that Hercules considered these facts, and because he admired the natural advantages of Olympia, he found the place worthy of the festival and games which are still held here. Chapter 19 After forty days, given up to discussions in Olympia, in which many topics were handled, Apollonius said, I will also, O men of Hellas, discourse to you in our several cities at your festivals, at your religious processions, at your mysteries, your sacrifices, at your public libations, and they require the services of a clever man. But for the present I must go down to Labadia, for I have never yet had an interview with Trophonius, although I once visited his shrine. And with these words he at once started for Boeotia, attended by every one of his admirers. Now the cavern in Labadia is dedicated to Trophonius, the son of Apollo and it can only be entered by those who resort thither in order to get an oracle, and it is not visible in the temple, but lies a little above it on a mound, and it is shut in by iron spits which surround it, and you descend into it as it were sitting down and being drawn down. Those who enter it are clad in white raiment, and are escorted thither with honey cakes in their hands to appease the reptiles which assail them as they descend but the earth brings them to the surface again, in some cases close by, but in other cases a long way off, for they are sent up to the surface beyond Locri and beyond Phocis, but most of them about the borders of Boeotia. Accordingly, Apollonius entered the shrine and said, I wish to descend into the cave in the interests of philosophy. 
But the priests opposed him, and though they told the multitude that they would never allow a wizard like him to examine and test the shrine, they pretended to the sage himself that only nefarious and impure women ever gave the oracles. So, on that day, he delivered a discourse at the springs of Herkina about the origin and conduct of the shrine. For it is the only oracle which gives responses through the person himself who consults it. And when the evening approached, he went to the mouth of the cave with his train of youthful followers. And having pulled up four of the obelisks, which constitute a bar to the passage, he went down below ground wearing his philosopher's mantle, having dressed himself as if he were going to deliver an address upon philosophy, a step which the god Trophonius so thoroughly approved of, that he appeared to the priests and not only rebuked them for the reception they had given Apollonius, but enjoined them all to follow him to Aulis, for he said it was there that he would come to the surface in such a marvelous fashion as no man before. And in fact, he emerged after seven days, a longer period than it had taken any one of those who, until then, had entered the oracle, and he had with him a volume thoroughly in keeping with the questions he had asked. For he had gone down, saying, What, O Trophonius, do you consider the most complete and purest philosophy? And the volume contained the tenets of Pythagoras. A good proof, this, that the oracle was in agreement with this form of wisdom. End of Volume 2, Book 8, Chapters 8 through 19. Volume 2, Book 8, Chapters 20 through 31 of The Life of Apollonius of Tyana. The Life of Apollonius of Tyana by Flavius Philostratus. Translated by F. C. Conybeare. Volume 2, Book 8. Chapter 20. This book is preserved in Antium, and the village in question, which is on the Italian seaboard, is much visited for the purpose of seeing it. I must acknowledge that I only heard these details from the inhabitants of Labadia, but in regard to the volume in question, I must set on record my conviction that it was subsequently conveyed to the Emperor Hadrian at the same time as certain letters of Apollonius, though by no means all of them, and it remained in the palace at Antium, which was that one of his Italian palaces in which this emperor took most pleasure. Chapter 21 From Ionia also there came to see him the band of companions who were named in Hellas as the company of Apollonius, and mixing with the people of the place, they formed a band of youths, remarkable for their number and for their philosophic enthusiasm. For the science of rhetoric had been left neglected, and little attention was paid to the professors of the art, on the ground that the tongue was their only teacher. But now they were all impelled to study his philosophy. But he, like Gyges and Croesus, who, they say, left the door of their treasuries unlocked, in order that all who needed might fill their pockets from them, threw open the treasures of his wisdom to all who loved it, and allowed them to ask him questions upon every subject. Chapter 22 But certain persons accused him of dissuading his pupils from visiting the governors, and of influencing them to lead lives of quiet and retirement instead and one of them uttered the jest that he drove away his sheep as soon as he found any forensic orator approaching. Said Apollonius, Yes, by Zeus, lest these wolves should fall upon my flock. What was the meaning of this sally? He saw these forensic orators looked up to by the multitude as they made their way up from poverty to great riches, and he saw that they so welcomed the feuds of others that they actually conducted a traffic in hatred and feud. Accordingly, he tried to dissuade these young men from associating with them, and those that did so associate with them, he sharply reproved, as if to wash off them a monstrous stain. For he had been long before on bad terms with them, and his experience of the prisons in Rome, and of the persons who were confined and perishing in them, so prejudiced him against the forensic art, as that he believed all these evils were due to psychophants and lawyers puffed up by their own cleverness, rather than to the despot himself. Chapter 23 
Just at the time when he was holding these conversations with the people of Hellas, the following remarkable portent overspread the heavens. The orb of the sun was surrounded by a wreath which resembled a rainbow, but dimmed the sunlight. That the heavenly sign portended a revolution was, of course, clear to all. However, when the governor of Hellas summoned Apollonius from Athens to Boeotia and said, I hear that you have a talent for understanding things divine, he replied, Yes, and perhaps you have heard that I have some understanding of human affairs. He replied, I have heard it, and I quite agree. Apollonius said, Since then you are of one opinion with me, I would advise you not to pry into the intentions of the gods, for this is what human wisdom recommends you to do. And when he besought Apollonius to tell him what he thought, for he said he was afraid lest night should ensue and swallow up everything, Apollonius said, Be of good cheer, for there will be some light following such a night as this. Chapter 24 After this, seeing that he had had enough of the people of Hellas, after living for two years among them, he set sail for Ionia, accompanied by his society, and the greater part of his time he spent teaching philosophy at Smyrna and Ephesus, though he also visited the rest of the cities, and in none of them was he found to be an unwelcome guest. Indeed, they all considered him to be worth their regret when he left them, and to the better class of people he was a great boon. Chapter 25 And now the gods were about to cast down Domitian from his presidency of mankind. For it happened that he had just slain Clemens, a man of consular rank, to whom he had lately given his own sister in marriage, and he issued a command about the third or fourth day after the murder, that she also should follow her husband and join him. Thereupon Stephanos, a freed man of the lady, who he was signified by the form of the late portent, whether because of the latest victim's fate rankled in his mind, or the fate of all others, made an attempt upon the tyrant's life worthy of comparison with the feats of the champions of Athenian liberty. For he concealed a dagger against his left forearm, and carrying his hand in a bandage as if it were broken, he approached the emperor as he left the law court, and said, I would have a private interview with you, my prince, for I have important news to communicate to you. The latter did not refuse him the audience but took him apart into the men's apartment where he transacted business of state. Whereupon the assassin said, Your bitter enemy, Clement, is not dead, as you imagine, but he lives, and I know where he is, and he is making ready to attack you. When the emperor uttered a loud cry over this information, before he could recover his composure, Stephanos threw himself upon him, and drawing his dagger from the hand which he had trussed up, he stabbed him in the thigh, inflicting a wound which was not immediately mortal, though it was well timed in view of the struggle which followed. The emperor was still strong and full of bodily vigor, although he was about five and forty years of age, and in spite of the wound he closed with his assailant, and throwing him down, kneeled upon him and dug out his eyes and crushed his cheeks with the stand of a gold cup, which lay thereby for use in sacred ceremonies, at the same time calling upon Athena to assist him. Thereupon his bodyguard, realizing that he was in distress, rushed into the room pell-mell, and dispatched the tyrant, who had already swooned. Chapter 26 Although the deed was done in Rome, Apollonius was a spectator of it in Ephesus. For about midday he was delivering an address in the groves of the colonnade, just at the moment when it all happened in the palace at Rome. And first he dropped his voice, as if he were terrified, and then, though with less vigor than was usual with him, he continued his exposition, like one who, between his words, caught glimpses of something foreign to his subject. And at last he lapsed into silence, like one who has been interrupted in his discourse and with an awful glance at the ground, and stepping forward three or four paces from his pulpit, he cried, Smite the tyrant! Smite him! Not like one who derives from some looking-glass a faint image of the truth, 
but as one who sees things with his own eyes and is taking part in a tragedy. All Ephesus, for all Ephesus was at his lecture, was struck dumb with astonishment, but he, pausing like those who are trying to see and wait until their doubts are ended, said, Take heart, gentlemen, for the tyrant has been slain this day, and why do I say today? Now it is, by Athena, even now at the moment I uttered my words and then lapsed into silence. The inhabitants of Ephesus thought that this was a fit of madness on his part, and although they were anxious that it should be true, yet they were anxious about the risk they ran in giving ear to his words. Whereupon he added, I am not surprised at those who do not yet accept my story, for not even all Rome as yet is cognizant of it. But behold, Rome begins to know it, for the rumor runs this way and that, and thousands now are convinced of it, and they begin to leap for joy. Twice as many before, and twice as many as they, and four times as many, yea, the whole of the populace there. And this news will travel hither also, and although I would have you defer your sacrifices in honor thereof to the fitting season, when you will receive this news, I shall proceed at once to pray to the gods for what I have seen. Chapter 27 They were still skeptical when swift runners arrived with the good news, and bore testimony to the sage's wisdom. For the tyrant's murder, and the day which brought the event to birth, the hour of midday, and the murderers to whom he addressed his exhortation, everything agreed with the revelation which the gods had made to Apollonius in the midst of his harangue. And thirty days later, Nerva sent him a letter to say that he was already in possession of the empire of the Romans, thanks to the good will of the gods and to his good counsels. And he added that he would more easily retain it if Apollonius would come to advise him. Whereupon, at the moment the latter wrote to him the following enigmatical sentence, We will, my prince, enjoy one another's company for a very long time, during which neither shall we govern others nor others us. Perhaps he realized when he wrote thus, that it was not to be long before he himself should quit this human world, and that Nerva was only to retain the throne for a short time, for his reign lasted but one year and four months, when he left behind him the reputation of having been a sober and serious ruler. Chapter 28 But as he did not wish to seem to neglect so good a friend and ruler, he composed later on for him a letter giving him advice about matters of state, and calling Damis to him, he said, You are wanted here, for this letter which I have written to the king contains secrets, and though it is written, they are of such a kind that they must be communicated orally either by myself or through you. And Damis declares that he only understood his master's device much later, for that the letter was composed in admirable style, and though it treated of important subjects, yet it might equally well have been sent through anyone else. What then was the sage's device? All through his life, he is said often to have exclaimed, Live unobserved, and if that cannot be, slip unobserved from life. His letter, then, and Damis's visit to Rome were of the nature of an excuse for getting the latter out of the way, in order that he might have no witnesses of his disillusion. Damis accordingly says that, though he was much affected at leaving him, in spite of his having no knowledge of what was coming, yet Apollonius, who knew full well, said nothing of it to him, and far from addressing him after the manner of those who are never to see one another again, so abundant was his conviction that he would exist for ever, merely pledged him in these words. O Damis, even if you have to philosophize by yourself, keep your eyes upon me. Chapter 29 The memoirs, then, of Apollonius of Tyana, which Damis the Assyrian composed, end with the above story. For with regard to the manner in which he died, if he did actually die, there are many stories, though Damis has repeated none. 
But as for myself, I ought not to omit even this, for my story should, I think, have its natural ending. Neither has Damis told us anything about the age of our hero, but there are some who say that he was eighty, others that he was over ninety, others again who say that his age far exceeded a hundred. He was afresh in all his body and upright when he died, and more agreeable to look at than in his youth. For there is a certain beauty, even in wrinkles, which was especially conspicuous in his case, as is clear from the likenesses of him which are preserved in the temple at Tyana, and from accounts which praise the old age of Apollonius more than was once praised the youth of Alcibiades. Chapter 30 Now there are some who relate that he died in Ephesus, tended by two maidservants, for the freedmen of whom I spoke at the beginning of my story were already dead. One of these maids he emancipated, and was blamed by the other one for not conferring the same privilege upon her. But Apollonius told her that it was better for her to remain the other's slave, for that that would be the beginning of her well-being. Accordingly, after his death, this one continued to be the slave of the other, who, for some insignificant reason, sold her to a merchant from whom she was purchased. Her new master, although she was not good-looking, nevertheless fell in love with her, and being a fairly rich man, made her his legal wife, and had legitimate children by her. Others again say that he died in Lindus, where he entered the temple of Athena and disappeared within it. Others again say that he died in Crete, in a much more remarkable manner than the people of Lindus relate. For they say that he continued to live in Crete, where he became a greater center of admiration than ever before, and that he came to the temple of Dictyna late at night. Now this temple is guarded by dogs, whose duty it is to watch over the wealth deposited in it, and the Cretans claim that they are as good as bears or any other animals equally fierce. Nonetheless, when he came, instead of barking, they approached him and fawned upon him, as they would not have done even with people they knew familiarly. The guardians of the shrine arrested him in consequence, and threw him in bonds as a wizard and a robber, accusing him of having thrown to the dogs some charmed morsel. But about midnight he loosened his bonds, and after calling those who had bound him, in order that they might witness the spectacle, he ran to the doors of the temple, which opened wide to receive him. And when he had passed within, they closed afresh, as if they had been shut, and there was heard a chorus of maidens singing from within the temple, and their song was this, Hasten thou from earth, hasten thou to heaven, hasten. In other words, do thou go upwards from earth. Chapter 31 And even after his death he continued to preach that the soul is immortal, and although he taught this account of it to be correct, Yet he discouraged men from meddling in such high subjects. For there came to Tyana a youth who did not shrink from acrimonious discussions, and would not accept truth in argument. Now Apollonius had already passed away from among men, but people still wondered at his passing, and no one ventured to dispute that he was immortal. This being so, the discussions were mainly about the soul, for a band of youths were there passionately addicted to wisdom. The young man in question, however, would on no account allow the tenet of the immortality of the soul, and said, I myself, gentlemen, have done nothing now for over nine months, but pray to Apollonius that he would reveal to me the truth about the soul. But he is so utterly dead that he will not appear to me in response to my entreaties, nor give me any reason to consider him immortal. Such were the young man's words on that occasion. But on the fifth day following, after discussing the same subject, he fell asleep where he was talking with them, and of the young men who were studying with him, some were reading books, and others were industriously drawing geometric figures on the ground, when, on a sudden, like one possessed, he leapt up from an uneasy sleep, streaming with perspiration, and cried out, I believe thee! And when those who were present asked him what was the matter, he said, Do you not see? Apollonius the sage, 
how that he is present with us and is listening to our discussion, and is reciting wondrous verses about the soul. They asked, But where is he? For we cannot see him anywhere, although we would rather do so than possess all the blessings of mankind. And the youth replied, It would seem that he has come to converse with myself alone concerning the tenets which I would not believe. Listen, therefore, to the inspired argument which he is delivering. The soul is immortal, and tis no possession of thine own, but of providence. And after the body is wasted away, like a swift horse freed from its traces, it lightly leaps forward and mingles itself with the light air, loathing the spell of harsh and painful servitude which it has endured. But for thee, what use is there in this? Some day when thou art no more, thou shalt believe it. So why, as long as thou art among living beings, dost thou explore these mysteries? Here we have a clear utterance of Apollonius, established like an oracular tripod, to convince us of the mysteries of the soul, to the end that cheerfully, and with due knowledge of our own true nature, we may pursue our way to the goal appointed by the fates. With any tomb, however, or cenotaph of the sage I never met, that I know of, although I have traversed most of the earth, and have listened everywhere to stories of his divine quality. And his shrine at Tyana is singled out and honored with royal officers, for neither have the emperors denied to him the honors of which they themselves were held worthy. End of Volume 2, Book 8 The Epistles of Apollonius of Tyana, Numbers 1-37 through 37. From the Life of Apollonius of Tyana The Life of Apollonius of Tyana by Flavius Philostratus Translated by F. C. Conybeare The Epistles of Apollonius of Tyana Epistle 1 to Euphrates As for myself, I am on friendly terms with philosophers. With sophists, however, or low clerks, or any such other kind of wretches, I am neither on friendly terms now, and heaven forbid I should ever be so at any later time. Although this does not apply to you, unless indeed you chance to be one of them, the following words do very much apply to you. Heal and remedy your passions, and try to be a philosopher, and not to be jealous of those who really are such. For in your case, old age is already at hand, and death. Epistle 2. To the same. For as much as virtue cometh by nature, by acquirement, by use, each of these may be held to be worthy of acceptation. See then whether you have any one of them, and either give up the teaching of wisdom for the future, or at least communicate it freely and for nothing to those who associate with you. For you already have the riches of megabyses. Epistle 3. To the same. You have visited the countries that lie between me and Italy, beginning from Syria, parading yourself in the so-called royal cities. And you had a philosopher's doublet all the time, and a long white beard, but besides that, nothing. And now, how comes it that you are returning by sea with a full cargo of silver, of gold, of vases of all sorts, of embroidered raiment, of every other sort of ornament? not to mention overweening pride and boasting and unhappiness. What cargo is this, and what the purport of these strange purchases? Zeno never purchased but dried fruits. Epistle 4 to the same. You would need little for your servants, if only they were servants of a philosopher. Nay, you should not even think of purchasing more than you really want especially as you incur some ill fame thereby. But since you have once made the mistake, the next best thing would be if you made as much haste as possible to give away some of what you have to others. You will still retain both your fatherland and your friends. Epistle 5 to the same. There is no need henceforth for any inmate of his garden or follower of his school to plead the merit of one of the discourses of Epicurus, which is entitled, 
about pleasure. For a genuine advocate thereof has turned up in the porch itself. But if, by way of contradiction, you should bring out the lectures and tenets of Chrysippus, let me point out to you a certain passage in the emperor's correspondence, namely this. Euphrates has taken money of me, and has taken it a second time. Now Epicurus would never have taken it. Epistle 6 to the same. I lately asked some rich men if they foster such bitter feelings, and they answered, How can we do otherwise? So I asked them what was the reason for their duress, and they blamed their wealth. But you, my poor wretch, only acquired your wealth yesterday. Epistle 7 to the same. As soon as you have reached Agai in your hurry and discharged your ship there, you have to return again post-haste to Italy, where you must fawn as usual upon the sick, the old men, old women, orphans, rich men, dandies, Midas, Gaetai. For they say that a merchant must let out every reef. For myself, I would rather clear out the salt cellar in the house of Themis. Epistle 8 to the same. Perhaps, then, you would like to draw up a little indictment of me. I only wish you had the pluck to do so, and you would be able to repeat these hackneyed and obvious accusations. Apollonius utterly declines to take a bath. Yes, and what's more, he never quits his house and takes care never to soil his feet. You never see him moving any part of his person. Yes, for he never moves anything except his soul. He wears his hair long on his head. Well, and so does the Helen, because he is a Helen and not a barbarian. He wears linen raiment. Yes, for this purest garb is that of priests. He practices divination. Yes, for many are the things we know not, and there is no other way of foreseeing anything that is going to happen. But such practices are not consonant with philosophy. Nevertheless, they befit the deity. And moreover, he eases the flesh of its agonies and allies suffering. You might equally bring this charge against Asclepius. He eats alone. Yes, and the rest of the world feed. He uses few words and on few occasions. Yes, for he has a faculty of holding his tongue altogether. He abstains from all flesh and from eating any animal food. That is surely a proof of his humanity. If you tell me, Euphrates, that you have put these counts into your indictment, you will probably add the following as well. If there had been any going, he would have taken money, as I have, and presents and civil promotions. If there had been money going, he would not have taken it. Nay, but he would have taken it for his country. Yes, but that is not one's country which knows not what it hath. Epistle 9 to Dion If your object is to please, you had better employ flute and lyre than argument. For they are the instruments which are made to minister to pleasure and the art of doing so is named music. But argument finds out the truth, and at this you should aim in your actions, at this in your words, at least if you are really making a philosophic study of it. Epistle 8 to the same. Some people ask the reason why I have left off giving lectures to large audiences. Let all know, then, who may be interested to understand such matters, no discourse can be really useful, unless, if it be single, it be also delivered to a single individual. Any one then who discourses in any other manner is motivated by vain glory to discourse. Epistle 11 to the Chief Counselors of Caesarea Men's first need is of gods for everything and above everything, their second of cities, for next after the gods we must honor our cities. And if we are men of sense, we prefer our cities' welfare. Now, if yours were only one city of many, 
instead of being, as it is, the greatest in Palestine, excelling all others there in size and in laws, and in institutions, and in the warlike virtues of ancestors, and still more in the arts and manners of peace, I should still see reason to admire and honor your city more than all others, and so would every man who has any sense. By common report, this would be the reason for preferring your city in a comparison of it with the run of cities. But whenever a city leads the way in paying honor to a single individual, and that one who is a stranger, and comes from afar off, seeing that it is a city which honors him, what can the individual do by way of return, and what worthy repayment of yourselves is possible? This, perhaps, and none other, that if he is a man beloved of the gods by reason of some natural endowment, he should pray that the city may obtain all blessings, and that his prayer may be granted. This I shall never cease to do in your behalf, for I am pleased to see the manners of Hellenism revealing their own excellence, and doing it by means of public inscriptions. But, as Apollonides, the son of Aphrodisius, is a young man of firm and constant character, and worthy to bear your name, I shall endeavor to render him of use to you in every particular, with the help of some good fortune. Epistle 12. To the Chief Counselors of Seleucia Whatever city is so well affected as yours, both towards the gods and towards such men as are worthy of acceptation, is both blessed in itself and contributes to the excellence of those in whose favor it bears witness. Now, though it is not difficult to lead the way in displaying graceful goodwill, indeed it is the noblest of human acts, it is yet not easy to requite it, nay, it is altogether impossible to find a true equivalent. For I imagine that what in time sequence is second can never in nature be first. Consequently, I am obliged to ask heaven to reward you who have shown yourselves not only my superiors in ability, but also in deeds. For no man could possibly rise to such achievements as yours. It is a further proof of your gracious good will towards me that you also wish me to visit you, as I would pray to have visited you already. Your envoys are the more precious to me because they are already my friends. I mean Hieronymus and Zenon. Epistle 13 To the Same Persons Straton has indeed passed away from among men, and has left upon earth all that he had of mortality. But we who are here, still undergoing punishment, in other words, still living, ought to have some concern for his affairs. One of us, then, must do one thing, another, another and it is our duty to do it now rather than later. For if in the past we were, some of us, known as his relations, and some of us merely as his friends, now is the time to show with all sincerity that we really are such. Nor must we delay doing our duty to an indefinite future, supposing these names meant anything. I myself, however, am desirous in this matter to be especially your friend and therefore I undertake to bring up myself, Alexander, who was his son by Seleucius, and to impart to him my own education. And I should certainly have given him money also, who am bestowing what is so much more important, if it were right that he should receive it. Epistle 14 To Euphrates I have been asked by many people on many occasions why it is that I have never been sent for to Italy, or, if I was sent for, why I did not come thither like yourself and sundry other people. Now, to the first question, I shall give no answer, lest some should think that I knew the reason, whereas I am not interested to know it. But as regards the second question, why need I say more than that I would rather have been sent for than go? Farewell. Epistle 15. To the Same. Plato has said that true virtue recognizes no master. And supposing anyone fails to honor this answer and delight therein, and instead of doing so sells himself for filthy lucre, 
I say that he but gives himself many masters. Epistle 16 to the same. You think it is your duty to call philosophers who follow Pythagoras magicians, and likewise also those who follow Orpheus. For my own part, I think that those who follow no matter whom ought to be called magicians, if only they are determined to be divine and just men. Epistle 17 to the same. The Persians give the name of Magi to divine beings. A magus, then, is either a worshipper of the gods, or one who is by nature divine. Well, you are no magus, but a man without God. Epistle 18, to the same. Heraclitus, the natural philosopher, used to say that man is by nature irrational. Well, if this be true, as it is true, then let everyone hide his face who vainly and idly is held in repute. Epistle 19. To Scopelianus the Sophist. In all, there are five characters in rational discourse. The philosopher, the historian, the advocate, the writer of epistles, the commentator. And when these general characters have been settled, there emerges afresh in sequence of dignity, first, he who is peculiar by reason of his own faculties or nature, but there comes second he who is an imitator of the best, supposing he be one of those who lack natural endowment. But the best is both difficult to find and difficult to appraise. Consequently, his own character is more fitting for each man to assume, so far forth as it is also more lasting. Epistle 20 To Domitian If you have power, and you have it, then it would be well if you also acquired prudence. For supposing you have prudence, but to lack power, you would have been equally in need of power. For the one of these ever stands in need of the other, just as the eye needs light, and light the eye. Epistle 21. To the same. It were best you should hold aloof from barbarians, and not aspire to rule them. For it is not right that they, being barbarians, should find in you a benefactor. Epistle 22 to Les Bosnax You should try to be poor as an individual, but to be rich as a member of humanity. Epistle 23 to Crito Pythagoras has declared that the divinest thing we have is the healing art. But if the divinest thing is the healing art, then we must take care of the soul as well as of the body. For surely a living creature cannot be in sound health, if, in respect of its highest element, it be diseased. Epistle 24 To the Presidents of the Olympic Games and to the Eleans You invite me to attend the Games of Olympia, and have sent me envoys to that effect and I would come to be a spectator of your physical rivalries if it did not involve my abandoning the greater arena of moral struggle. Epistle 25 to the Peloponnesians The second phase of your relations with one another were the Olympic Games, and though in the first phase you were frankly enemies, in this second you still were not friends. Epistle 26 to the priests in Olympia. The gods are in no need of sacrifices. What then can one do in order to win their favor? One can, in my opinion, acquire wisdom, and, so far as one can, do good to such men as deserve it. This pleases the gods. Atheists, however, can offer sacrifice. Epistle 27 To the priests in Delphi the priests defile the altar with blood, and then some people ask in amazement why our cities are visited with calamities, when they have courted displeasure on the largest scale. Oh, what folly and dullness! Heraclitus was wise, but not even he could persuade the Ephesians not to purge away mud with mud. Epistle 28 To the King of the Scythians Zamolxis was a good man, 
and inasmuch as he was a disciple of Pythagoras, a philosopher. And if in his time the Roman had been such as he is now, he would have been glad to be friends with him. But if it is for freedom that you think you ought to struggle and make endeavor, make yourself known as a philosopher, that is to say, as a free man. Epistle 29 to a Legislator Festivals lead to epidemics, for although they refresh men after their toil, they promote gluttony. Epistle 30 to the Roman Questors You hold the highest office of the realm. If, then, you understand how to govern, why are the cities incessantly declining under your regime? But if you do not understand, you ought first to learn, and then to govern. Epistle 31 to the Procurators of Asia What is the use of cutting off branches of wild trees whose growth does harm when you leave the roots alone? Epistle 32 to the Scribes of the Ephesians it is no use decorating your city with statues and elaborate pictures and promenades and theaters, unless there is good sense there as well as law. For although good sense and law may accompany these, they are not the same thing. Epistle 33 to the Milesians Your children lack fathers, your youth lack old men, your wives husbands, your husbands rulers, your rulers laws, your laws philosophers, your philosophers gods, your gods faith. Your ancestors were good men, your present estate you may well loathe. Epistle 34 To the Wise Men in the Museum I have been in Argos and Phocis and Locris, and in Sicyon and in Megara, and after holding public lectures in the past in those places, I have ceased to do so any more. Why so? If anyone asks me the reason, I must reply to you and to the muses in the words of the poet, I have been turned into a barbarian, not by long sojourning outside Hellas, but by long sojourning in her midst. Epistle 35 to Hestiaeus Virtue and wealth are, with us, most opposed to one another. For a diminution of the one leads to an increase of the other, and an increase to a diminution. How, then, can both at once be united in the same man, except in the imagination of fools, who take wealth even for virtue? Do not, then, allow men here to misunderstand me so profoundly, nor permit them to consider me rich rather than a philosopher. For I account it most disgraceful that I should be held to travel abroad in search of money, when there are some who, in order to leave a monument of themselves, have not even embraced virtue. Epistle 36 to Bassus of Corinth Praxiteles of Chalcis was a madman. On one occasion he came with a drawn sword to my door, and it was yourself who sent him, you a philosopher and president of the Isthmian Games. But the reward you were to give him for murdering me was access to your own wife. And, you foul wretch, Bassus, I had on many occasions been your benefactor. Epistle 37 to the same. If any Corinthian asks, what did the father of Bassus die of? Everyone, citizen and sojourner in the land alike, will answer, by poison. And who administered it? Even the neighbors will tell you, the philosopher. And this wretch wept as he followed his father's buyer. End of Epistles 1 through 37. Epistles 38 through 61 from the Life of Apollonius of Tyana. The Life of Apollonius of Tyana by Flavius Philostratus, translated by F. C. Conybear. Volume 2 The Epistles of Apollonius of Tyana. Epistle 38 To the People of Sardis You award no prizes for good qualities, for what good qualities have you? But if you were inclined to compete for the first prize in vice, you would all win it at once. Who is it that says such things about the people of Sardis? The people of Sardis themselves. 
For the people there, no one is the friend of another, to the extent of denying out of good will the most monstrous charges. Epistle 39 to the same people. The very names of your social orders are disgusting. Witness the Kodari and the Exurisitori. These are the first names you give your children, and you are lucky to be worthy of them. Epistle 40 to the same people. Kodari and Exurisitari. And how are you going to call your daughters and your wives? For they too belong to the same castes, and are more forward than yourselves. Epistle 41 to the same people. You cannot expect even your servants to be well-wishers of yourselves, firstly because they are servants, and secondly because most of them belong to castes opposed to your own, for they too, like yourselves, have their pedigrees. Epistle 42 to the Platonic thinkers. If anyone offers money to Apollonius, and he considers the donor to be worthy, he will accept it if he is in need. But for his philosophy, he will take no reward, even though he be in want. Epistle 43 To those who are puffed up with wisdom. If anyone professes to be my disciple, let his profession be that he remains within his house, that he abstains from all bathing, that he kills no living creature nor eats flesh, that he is exempt from feelings of jealousy, of spite, of hatred, of slander, of enmity, in order to bear the name of a free man and belong to their class. For surely he must beware of carrying about a pretense of manners and character and a language which he merely feigns, in order to make others believe that he leads the life which he does not. Farewell. Epistle 44 to Hestiaeus, his brother. Other men regard me as the equal of the gods, and some of them even as a god. But until now, my own country alone ignores me, my country for which in particular I have striven to be distinguished. What wonder is there in this? For not even on you, my brothers, as I perceive, has it clearly dawned that I am superior to most men, both in my language and in my character. For otherwise, how could you judge me so harshly as to need to be reminded of all these matters about which, as about no others, even the dullest persons are likely to resent instruction, to wit, about country and brethren? Nevertheless, you must be aware that it is a noble thing to regard the whole earth as your country, and all men as your brethren and friends seeing that they are the family of one God, that they are of one nature, and that there is a communion of each and all in speech, and likewise in feeling, which is the same, no matter how or where a man has been born, whether he is barbarian or whether he is a Helen, so long only as he is a man. But there is, it must be admitted, a kinship which overrides philosophical theory, and a familiarity which attracts to itself everything that shares it. So the Odysseus of Homer, as they relate, did not prefer even immortality when a goddess offered it to Ithaca. And for my own part, I notice that this law pervades even the animal kingdom, for there is not a single bird that will sleep away from its own nest. And though the fishermen may drag the tenants of the deep from their lair, yet they will return unless they are overcome. As for wild beasts, neither hunger nor satiety induces them to remain outside their holes. And man is one of these creatures that nature hath so produced, even though he bear the name of sage, for whom all the earth may supply everything else, but can never call up before his eyes the sepulchres of his fathers. Epistle 45 to the same if philosophy be the most precious thing in existence, and if we are convinced that we are philosophers, we cannot rightly be supposed to hate our brethren, and that for a mean and illiberal reason. For it appears our misunderstanding is on the point of money, and that is something we tried to despise even before we became philosophers. And therefore it is more likely and reasonable that you should suspect me of having neglected to write to you for some other reason than that. 
for in fact I was as much afraid to write you the truth, because you might think me boastful, as to write you less than the truth, for fear you might think me over humble. And both of these things are equally annoying no less to brethren than to friends. Now, however, I have this information to give you. If heaven should perhaps consent, I will, after meeting my friends in Rhodes, shortly depart thence, and return to you towards the end of spring. Epistle 46 to Gordius They tell me that Hestiaius has been wronged by yourself, in spite of your having been his friend, if indeed you are the friend of any one. Beware, then, my Gordius, lest you find yourself in conflict not with the semblance of a man, but with the reality. My greetings to your son, Aristocleides, who may, I pray, never resemble yourself. And yet you, as a young man, were beyond reproach. Epistle 47 To the Senate and People of Tyana You command me to return to you, and I obey. For the greatest compliment a city can pay to one of its own citizens is to recall him in order to do him honor. And during the whole time that I have been away from your city, I have, although it may be presumptuous to say so, striven to win for you, by my sojourning abroad, good fame and name and good will and the friendship of distinguished cities and equally of distinguished men. And if you merit a still wider and higher consideration, it is only myself and my own natural gifts which are capable of an effort involving so much ability and seriousness. Farewell. Epistle 48 to Diotimus You make a mistake in supposing that I want anything either from yourself, with whom I have never had anything in common, or from anybody else like you, or under like circumstances. But in fact, even what I have expended on any object conducive to your welfare has been inconsiderable. I shall be best pleased, therefore, if you accept my kindness without incurring any expense yourself. For in no other way but this shall I retain my principles intact." and that this is my way, and this my attitude towards all my fellow citizens, I might almost say towards all men, you can learn from the rest of the citizens who have accepted my kindness, as often as they stood in need thereof, but who have never been asked to make any return. Do not then take it amiss, if I have rebuked my servant as he deserved, for having in the first instance accepted anything, and if he at once handed back to Lysias your friend, and also a friend of my own, what he received, because he did not know personally any of your servants, whom you had left behind. But that there are two accounts of me current, and that they will continue to circulate even in the future, need I be surprised? For it is inevitable, in the case of every one at all prominent in any way, that there should be contradictory accounts of him in circulation. It was so with Pythagoras, with Orpheus, with Plato, and with Socrates. Not only were contradictory statements made about them, but they were embodied in writing as well. And we need not be surprised seeing that even concerning God himself, men's accounts differ from one another. However, good men, by a sort of natural affinity, will accept the truth, just as bad men will accept the opposite and we can afford to laugh at such people, I mean the worst sort. This much only it is right for the moment to impress upon you about myself, that even the gods have spoken of me as of a divine man, not only on many occasions to private individuals, but also in public. I shall shock you if I speak more, or more highly of myself. I pray for your good health. Epistle 49 to Ferrucianus I am very delighted with the letters which you have sent me, for they reveal much intimacy and reminiscence of my family, and I am sure that you are most anxious to see me and to be seen by me. I shall therefore visit you as soon as possible. Wherefore, please remain at home. And you shall converse with me when I have arrived at your residence, in preference to any of your other friends and intimates since it is right that you should do so. Epistle 50 to Euphrates 
even the most wise Pythagoras belonged to the class of demons. But you still seem to me to be utterly remote from philosophy and from true science, or you would neither abuse that great man nor persist in hating certain of those who follow him. You should turn to something else now. For you have missed your cue in philosophy, nor have you hit it off better than Phandorus when he aimed at Menelaus in the episode of the violation of oaths. Epistle 51 To the Same Person There are those who rebuke you for having taken money from the emperor. There would be nothing absurd in your doing so, were it not clear that you have taken money rewards for your philosophy on so many occasions, and on such a large scale, and from so many persons, and from people whom you had got to believe that you were a philosopher. Epistle 52 To the Same Person If anyone converses with a Pythagorean, and asks what boons and how many he shall derive from him, I should myself answer as follows. He will acquire legislative science, geometry, astronomy, arithmetic, knowledge of harmony and of music, and of the physician's art, godlike divination in all its branches, and the still better qualities of magnanimity, greatness of soul, magnificence, constancy, reverence, knowledge, and not mere opinion of the gods, direct cognizance of demons and not mere faith, friendship with both, independence of spirit, assiduity, frugality, limitation of his needs, quickness of perception, quickness of movement, quickness in breathing, excellence of color, health, courage, immortality. And from you, Euphrates, what have your companions obtained that you can keep? Surely no more than the excellence which you possess yourself. Epistle 53 Claudius to the Senate of Tyana Apollonius, your citizen, a Pythagorean philosopher, has made a brilliant sojourn in Hellas, and has done much good to our young men. Having conferred upon him the honors he deserved, and which are proper to good men who are so truly eminent in philosophy, we have desired to manifest to you by letter our good will. Fare ye well. Epistle 44 Apollonius to the Censors of Rome some of you have taken trouble to provide harbors and public buildings and enclosures and promenades, but neither you yourselves nor your laws evince any solitude for the children of your cities, or for the young, or for women. Were it not so, it would be a fine thing to be one of your subjects. Epistle 55 Apollonius to his brother Everything, when it hath reached maturity, hath a natural tendency to vanish away, and this is old age for every man, after which he remaineth no more. Let not, therefore, the loss of thy wife in the flower of her age grieve thee beyond measure, nor, because such a thing as death is spoken of, imagine that life is superior thereto, when it is altogether inferior in the eyes of one who reflects." Make thyself, then, the brother of one that is a philosopher, in the common acceptation of the word, and, in particular, is a Pythagorean and Apollonius, and restore the former estate of thy household. For, if we had found anything to blame in thy former wife, we might reasonably expect thee to shrink from another union. But, inasmuch as she was consistently holy and pure, and attached to her husband, and therefore worthy of your regrets, what should lead us to expect that a second wife should not resemble her? Nay, she would in all probability be encouraged to improve in virtue by the fact that her predecessor was not forgotten nor wronged by neglect of her memory. And would I pray thee seriously to concern thyself about the condition of thy brethren as up to the present it is? For thy elder brother has never yet had offspring, and though thy younger brother may still look forward to having a child, yet it is only in the far future. And so here are we, three sons, the children of a single father, and we three between us have not a single son. 
wherefore there is great risk no less for our country than for the life of our posterity for if we are better than our father though of course so far forth as he was our father we are worse how can we not reasonably expect our descendants to be still better i trust then that there may be some to whom we may at least hand on our names as our ancestors devised these for us for my tears i am not able to write thee more for i have nothing more important than this to write epistle fifty six to the people of sardis croesus lost the empire of the lydians by crossing the river halis he was taken alive he was bound in chains he was set upon the high raised pyre he saw the fire lit and the flames rising aloft he was saved for it appeared that he was honored and valued by the god what then ensued this man your progenitor and also your king who had suffered so much that he deserved not to suffer was invited to the table of his enemy and became his adviser and well-wisher his faithful friend but you in your relations with your parents your children your friends kinsmen and tribesmen events nothing but truceless implacable irreconcilable hatred and worse than this unholy and godless frenzy ye have made yourselves hateful by neither crossing the halis nor receiving among yourselves any one from outside and yet earth bears you her fruit the earth is unjust epistle fifty seven to certain learned publicists light is the presence of fire without which it could not be now fire is itself an affection and that whereunto it comes is of course burnt up but light can only supply its own radiance to our eyes on condition of using not force to them but persuasion speech therefore in its turn resembles in its one aspect fire which is the affection and in its other the radiance which is light and i pray that the latter which is better may be mine unless indeed that which i speak of is beyond the reach of my prayer epistle fifty eight to valerius there is no death of any one save in appearance only even if there is no birth of any one or becoming except only in appearance for when a thing passes from essence into nature we consider that there is a birth or becoming and in the same way that there is a death when it passes from nature into essence though in truth a thing neither comes into being at any time nor is destroyed but it is only apparent at one time and later on invisible the former owing to the density of its material and the latter by the reason of its lightness or tenuity of the essence which however remains always the same and is always subject to differences of movement and state for this is necessarily the characteristic of change caused not by anything outside but by a conversion of the whole into the parts and by a return of the parts into the whole due to the oneness of the universe but if someone asks what is this which is at one time visible and at another invisible as it presents itself in the same or in different objects it may be answered that it is characteristic of each of the several genera of things here when it is full to be apparent to us because of the resistance of its density to our senses but to be unseen in case it is emptied of its matter by reason of its tenuity the latter being perforce shed abroad and flowing away from the eternal measure which confined it albeit the measure itself is never created nor destroyed why is it then that error has passed unrefuted on such a scale the reason is that some imagine that they have themselves actively brought about what they have merely suffered and experienced because they do not understand that a child brought into the world by parents is not begotten by its parents any more than what grows by means of the earth grows out of the earth nor are phenomenal modifications or affections of matter properties of the individual thing 
but it is rather the case that each individual's thing's affections are properties of a single phenomenon. And this single phenomenon cannot be rightly spoken of or characterized, except we name it the first essence. For this alone is agent and patient, making itself all things unto all and through all, God eternal, which, in so far as it takes on the names and persons of individuals, forfeits its peculiar character to its prejudice. Now this is of lesser importance. What is of greater is this, that some are apt to weep so soon as ever God arises out of mankind, by mere change of place and not of nature. But, in very truth of things, you should not lament another's death, but prize and reverence it. And the highest and only befitting honor you can pay to death is to resign unto God him that was here, and continue to rule, as before, over the human beings entrusted to your care. You dishonor yourself if you improve less through your judgment than by lapse of time, seeing that time alleviates the sorrows even of the wicked. High command is the most important of things, and he will best succeed in the most important office who has first learnt to govern himself. And what piety, moreover, is there in depicting that which has happened by the will of God? If there is an order of reality, and there is, and if God presides over it, the just man will not desire to deprecate his blessings, for such conduct savors of avarice and violates that order. But he will consider that what happens is for the best. Go forward, then, and heal yourself, dispense justice, and console the wretched. So will you wipe away men's tears. You must not prefer your private welfare to the public, but the public to your private. And think what manner of consolation is offered you, the entire province has mourned with you for the loss of your son. Reward those who have grieved with you, and you will far sooner reward them by ceasing to mourn than by confining yourself in your house. You have no friends, but you have a son. What the one who is just dead, you will ask? Yes, will be the reply of all who reflect. For that which exists is not lost, but exists by the very fact that it will be for ever. Or would you argue that that which has no existence comes into being? But how can you be without the description of that which is? Another might say that you are impious and unjust, impious towards God and unjust towards your son, nay, impious towards him rather than towards God. Would you then learn what death is? Send and slay me the moment I have uttered these words, and unless you can clothe them afresh with flesh, you have there and then made me superior to yourself. You have abundant time. You have a wife who is sensible, devoted to your husband. You are yourself sound in body. Take from yourself whatever lacks. One of the ancient Romans, in order to uphold the law and order of his state, slew his own son, and indeed slew him after crowning him. You are a governor of fifty cities, and noblest of the Romans, yet this present humor of yours is such as to prevent you from affording a stable government, even to your household, not to speak of cities and provinces. If Apollonius were with you, he would have persuaded Fabula not to mourn. Epistle 49 the king of the Babylonians, Garmos, to Neogindus, the king of the Indians. If you were not of a prying disposition, you would not be laying down the law in other people's affairs. Nor, as sovereign in India, would you be playing the judge for Babylonians. For how came you to know anything about my people? But just recently, you have made an attempt upon my kingdom, by trying to cajole me with your letters, and by insinuating into my realm such magistrates as these, and you try to cloak under the veil of philanthropy your own aggressive designs. But you will not succeed at all, for you cannot deceive me or take me in. Epistle 60 to Euphrates Praxiteles of Chalcis was a madman, 
he appeared at my door in Corinth, together with your friend, with a sword in his hand. What, then, is the reason of his attempting my life? For I have never driven off your oxen, seeing that between your philosophy and mine there intervene very many shadowy mountains and an echoing sea. Epistle 61 to Lesbonax Anacharsis the Scythian was a sage, but if he was a Scythian, then it was because he was a Scythian. End of Epistles 38-61